everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Alex Wade. Uh, my PhD was on uh, space and time in the video game. And um, I'm currently writing a book and I'm the final chapter of that, for, which is going to be published with Continuum next year. This is um, effectively a, a chapter, which I've put that in the book, and it's based on Paul Brio's theory of homology, which essentially he defines as a study of speed. Special recourse to video games in the 1980s, especially driving games, because Viridio talks a lot about the vehicle dashboard and the way that impacts upon society. And it also helps with uh, placing the video game within, within an historical context. Effectively, the talk is split into two parts. Uh, the first introduces Viridio's work on time, speed, and space, and the second applies this to the study of video games. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, who was born in Paris in 1932. Uh, he's especially influenced by the links between war, power and technology and its subsequent impact upon society. So Virilio is especially concerned with how real space is substituted by real time technologies. As he says, the functions traditionally distributed within the real space of the town are now exclusively taken over by the real time of the wiring of the human body. As the inhabitant of the teletopical meta city can no longer clearly distinguish here from elsewhere or private from public. This can be seen in the extensive use of social utilities such as Facebook uh, and Twitter, which substitute human to human interaction for peer to peer or machine to machine communication. Most importantly, for Virilio, there's an increasing emphasis placed on the annihilation of time over space and as he says with, with the increase of ICTs there is a new supremacy of real time of real space with the ultimate outcome that the temporal obliterates the spatial here no longer exists, everything is now the prostheses that allow us to communicate at speed are increase, uh, increasingly reduced and ethereal for instance commu computer mainframes which used to take incredible amounts of information uh, sorry, of space in laboratories now in comparison, a mobile phone has one trillion times the amount of storage space of the PDP-1, which is the first uh, computer to play the video game Space War. As technology becomes quicker, it becomes less noticeable in real space. Uh, it shrinks away until it becomes unnoticeable. So we, we see biometrics on passports and chips inserted under the skin of pets so they can move freely, as it were, through customs. The folding of space into time is demonstrated through air travel, which is a good example, and Virilio uses this uh, to show the way that the trip is increasingly reduced to a point, and its associated speed. As duration decreases of the trip, so the room available to the passengers decreases, not only creating an inability to physically move around the cabin of an airliner, but also by the personal consoles of music, films and games that are used to pacify passengers of civil aviation, and they generate a desire for inertia. This can also be seen in the way that the airport operates. Uh, the airport operate lim limits movement and prevents deviation from set lines. The airport comes to occupy the realisation of a hyper-rationalised process. We would do absolutely anything to travel at speed, including taking our clothes off in front of other passengers. Um, and Virilio thinks that there's something reminiscent of the prison or concentration camp in all of this, where we are humiliated by, humiliated by people in uniforms ordering us to follow commands under duress. So effectively, the faster we go, the less we move. We move into a kind of area of inertia. The irony is apparent. The more prosthesis that we have, the less we are able to move. In this respect, we become invalids, at one with the, tra one with the trajectory of the machine. The fighter pilot is surrounded by technology, but he cannot move from his incubator. Similarly, the invalid cannot move from their wheelchair, as it is the prosthesis attached to this, which keep them stationary, but moving. This is known as inertia, and as a celestial body such as a satellite it is in geostationary orbit. So relatively, it's in, in relation to the, to the Earth, it's stationary, but in absolute terms, it's moving at 50,000 miles an hour. So what are the effects of speed? As discussed before, while storage space increases exponentially, so the amount of space that it nominally takes up, 
in the world is reduced. In the last 20 years, for example, we've moved from bytes to kilobytes to gigabytes to terabytes and to exabytes. The swiftness of access to information has also increased in line with Moore's law, where processing power doubles in speed every 12 to 18 months. The cost of production halves in real terms. The types of terminology used to describe the way that technologies operate are indicative of the em emphasis placed upon speed. CPUs are overclocked. Mathematical calculations are measured in ter teraflops, and communication speed is measured by gross bit rate. So therefore, there is a paradox. The space of the digital increases, but the reduction in time taken to navigate that space actually, f actually falls. The medium which allows this to occur is speed. The internet is the current archetype of this medium. As the speed which it traverses time and space characterizes its movement towards the fountain of all knowledge. As Virilio says, the reality of information is entirely contained in, its speed of, in the speed of its dissemination. And information is only of any value if it is delivered fast. Better still, as Virilio says, that speed is information itself. Therefore, the medium, which is apposite in communication technology, is not the content or the style, but quite simply how quickly it can be transmitted. So this is the reason why the internet can find so many willing conspiracy theorists and why 24-hour news channels have proliferated in the last 10 years, simply because it is speed and not knowledge or content that is important. Everything needs to be known in the present tense or the present chronos, whether it is important or not. Therefore, the medium is not only the message, but intrinsic to lived experience, evidence in the incessant use of email, text message, keyboard and keypad, which via the speed of response from the integrated circuit of user and machine allows navigation of a proliferating space with increasing brevity. The dromology, as I intimated at the beginning, is the study of speed. With Virilio's theory of dromology, objects and surroundings come towards the user. Dromoscopy is therefore, the paradox, is therefore paradoxically the, the wait for the coming of what abides. That's how Virilio defines it, defines it. There is a concurrent convexing of space so that that which is furthest away becomes closest to us, such as the Beijing Olympics or the Iraq War. With this convexing of space, there is a supplementary effect or concentrating, of concentrating on egocentric rather than exocentric spaces. So there is a movement from grand projects of exploration to introspection and experimentation upon the self, as evidenced by DNA exploration, nanotech, and of course video games. So the emphasis on egocentric rather than exocentric space, which is realized in the everyday use of communi communication technologies, means that speed allows for everything to be satisfied in the present chronos, such is the nature of a society which is hooked on speed. The digital stretches around the world like a cling film, like cling film, which falsifies the depth, the length, the distances and, of space and time perspective. What is near is far, and what is in another time zone is next to us. In effect, technological prostheses liberate us from the banality of our bodies and identities and allow us to realise what is essentially impossible. As you can see from the, the quotes on the board, um, physical when you use something like GPS and Google Earth, physical space is flattened onto the square horizon of the screen where there is no more delay and no more relief. And relief here is used in the twin sense of the word. There's relief between interaction and relief in the topographical sense, which is shown on maps by contours and experience when we climb hills. However, as we know, the holy grail of many audiovisual technologies is to provide the illusion of depth, of topographical and temporal relief through the graphics that are used in suspension from the banalities of everyday life. For Virilio, the vehicle and its requisite mobility is indicative of the changing relationship that we have with the world as it is mediated through the technologies of speed. His starting point, when he talks about the vehicle, is the use of the windscreen, which means that we drive in increasingly in a world that unfolds as a film. It's letterboxed, it's flat, and we have a kind of tunnel vision happening. Dashboards also increase in complexity so that we have a cruise control uh, in vehicles, collision, to, collision warnings in South Park, so the potential for accidents, which is another key area that Virilio talks about or touches upon, accidents are dr dramatically reduced as we see control over the speed to technological prosthesis. The desert is also vital to Virilio, as this is where, where land speed attempts are made, and where in contemporary life many of the technologies of speed are developed, especially when we consider the military industrial complex. This is fully re realised in the use of the Reba unmanned aerial vehicle which is deployed in Afghanistan, but controlled from Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. 
It projects the pilot to the front line through the screen while distancing them from the danger of war or any potential flying accident. To comprehend how video games have mirrored this, I'm going to give examples from a range of games that use the vehicle and illustrate our change in relationship to, to time, speed and space through technology and the implications that that has for wider society. So the first example is from Sprint 2. The lack of processing speed in early games such as Sprint 2 meant that the environment didn't change and there was topographical relief as the game would look down upon the action. In this respect, this style of game is prehistoric and pre-technological as it provides relief for the player both spatially and temporally as there is a direct relationship between the distance, which is the space, and the duration, which is the time. However, this is the beginning of inertia. The gamer stands immobile at the console while the vehicle moves through space and time. If you can also see on there how technology is already taking control of some aspects of speed because it says at the bottom there, grey cars drive automatically and therefore controls part of the the windscreen, or in this case, the screen. The second example is from Monaco GP of 1980. This is one of the first video games to have the landscape moving towards a player, and also one of the first games to provide a deluxe model, which meant that the player was now sitting down and increasingly inert, mimicking the position of a Formula One driver. Also note how the, the car remains stationary as the landscape scrolls by, so it gives the illusion of movement, but what is actually happening is that the landscape's coming towards you, which is how Virilio sees our um, relationship to speed and to the environment. The third example is something that is probably only um, been experienced by people who played on the Commodore 64 in the UK. This is Motormania, but it does demonstrate the way in which the dashboard operates. Um, you can see that on the right-hand side of the screen, um, we have a dashboard that has miles per hour fuel and um, that's alternator. Um, and the use of the dashboard here has two effects. First, it reduces the size of the screen and therefore letterboxes the view through the screen and it generates an, an increased illusion of speed. Secondly, I, I believe that this was used on this game because it helps with the drawing of graphics as BASIC found it difficult to process the commands quickly enough to be able to put uh, a full screen version of that onto the television. Note how in keeping with really the dashboard shrinks its passenger's field of vision and the frame of the dashboard gives rise to an acceleration of the sequencing that reinforces the effect of the acceleration of the vehicle. So the less we can see through the screen, as it were, the quicker it appears to move. As a conceived representation of space, the dashboard allows for a double reduction, that of the distance time of the trip and that of the narrowness of the, of the frame of the sighting of the dashboard, which brings objects which are far away closer to us and tells us how much time and space we have left through the use of the fuel gauge and the voltmeter. So it was how far you could go in the game was contingent on how much fuel you had. The next example is from Battlezone. Um, as I've already talked about, Virilio uses war extensively as a testing ground of new technologies. The ultimate aim of war, and in fact any kind of martial art, any fighting at all, is to inflict as much damage as possible while minimising harm to the self. On the battleground, this is achieved through camouflage and the use of protective capsules such as tanks to prevent damage. The ideal warrior disappears and cannot be seen either through deception or camouflage. This is evident in an early game by Atari, which was called Combat, where in one game mode, the tank is only visible for a few seconds after the shot is fired. However, Battlezone places the gamer driver within the dashboard and is identified with a victorious vision to the point where the dashboard comes to seem rather like a misunderstood game of war. So firstly, this reveals a tactile relationship that we have with technology, fully integrating the player into this arena. Secondly, the use of radar, which you can see at the top of the screen there on the previous example, also substitutes the warrior for technology, flattening the space of the battlefield into a two-dimensional representation, as current technologies such as maps, GPS and Google Earth tend to do. Third, the innovative use of vector graphics in Battlezone counters this flattening of space by opening the battlefield to depth, so that the technology of vectors thus comes to replace the tactics of bodies. I'll give a quick, quick example from uh, Pole Position 2, which demonstrates inertia. Um, so, just notice how the 
the side of the track seems to slow down as you get quicker. So Proposition 2 is a sprite-based game which uses the third-person perspective. The advantage is that it provides a more colourful and interesting black backdrop, as you saw from that, but it does generate inertia, so as the, as the driver of the game goes further into the screen, the actual surroundings slow down. Uh, this sensation is greatly desired by F1 drivers, as it gives the impression that you are moving in slow motion. In this respect, it is the image generated through, with and by the screen, which is the ultimate aspiration of all vehicles, to be instantly and ubiquitously arriving at the same time as departure. It is effectively the annihilation of space through time. The next example is from TX1. Um, TX1 attempted to ape the quattrocentic, quattrocentic perspective of art, which allows for depth to be represented on canvas. Uh, it was first used in the Renaissance and allows for the spatial relationships between objects to be properly inhered into artwork. It creates what is known as a vanishing point, which is an indefinite point on the horizon beyond visual range. TX1 was a game that attempted to simulate the view from a car by providing three screens, as you can see it from there, uh, to simulate so that it was possible to see around the upcoming corner, and it generates what Virilio calls a quadriptic, where the traveller becomes a viewer of a moving canvas. TX1 also generates a distance between the player and the game. Through the use of time extend, the game indefinitely extends the journey through time and space, so you reach, a, you reach a checkpoint, it says time extend, and you can go indefinitely in the game. So for Virilio, what he says was the greater the speed, the more distant the horizon, so the more you travel, or the quicker you go, the further the horizon gets away, which is the vanishing point. And therefore, the future de decides the present of the course. In this sense, the vanishing point is infinite and indefinite. Next example is from Outrun, which I'm sure everyone's played. Um, the use of a fixed camera behind the car in OutRun does away with any need for, the for three screens. So what this does is it places the game at in, firstly in one degree of inertia, as instead of following the attitude, in, it places the game in another degree of inertia. Instead of following the attitude in space of the surroundings, it follows the car, so the camera is fixed behind the car. This allows for greater draw distance and the proper representation of hills and valleys. Outrun renders the player inert, substitutes the movement of the car for the hydraulic movement of the deluxe cabinet. It was one of the first games to do that from Sega. So the gamer remains stationary, but still moves through the two axes in the cabinet and into the screen through the, through the game. Also, at the beginning of Outrun, the dashboard uh, it takes prevalence because you can select from three different uh, tunes before you play the game. And that provides a future orientation and also you have checkpoints in Outrun, so you effectively extend your time through space in that respect. And it, and it impels the player to keep going, irrespective of what has happened in the past. The final example that I'm going to give you is from Operation Wolf. Operation Wolf is a game which was played in a first-person perspective and forces the player literally into a battlefield to war in an unnamed Southeast Asian country. Operation Wolf has a dashboard which tots up, the damage, tots up the damage done to the player and provides a real-time logistical update of enemies, ammo and health remaining. As with Battlezone, this, re this replaces the warrior with technology, which intensifies fear without the accompanying injury. It is, as Virilio would say, a vectoral image of combat without battle but not without fear. It gives rise to an extermination that extends throughout the world and spreads its victims through, across the field of excess speed. So if I can just show you what happens at the end here. That's, yeah, this is it here. So this is before um, the game actually starts. As you can see from there, the final two levels of Operation Wolf are called Concentration Camp and Airport, respectively. Um, the pairing of two of the 20th century's most awesome technologies does not appear to be accidental. Pure speed is an intensification, a concentration as the arrival at Auschwitz was quite literally the terminal. So the airport terminal, through regulation and prohibition, as Virilio says, have the, has the, tra have the tragic character of, the tra of concentration camps. And this can be seen in the parallels between the two technologies. 
the linear passage through time and space in the concentration camp in the airport, the interminable, coming, the interminable wait for the coming of the future, the use of regulation and prohibition, the pseudo-paramilitary personnel, and the humiliation that have been forced to undress. We accept this as a matter of course, with no dissent, just a sad melancholy. Thank you. Is it that quick? I must have been falling over my words. Well, I haven't actually, so that would be a good example of a counter-argument to that because I explicitly concentrated on games that use what is effectively a, a vehicle in, in the sense that they're from the 1980s. So I haven't looked at first-person shooters. More to the point that I don't usually play them, so I have to admit I have a, a kind of skewing towards driving games, so that's probably what I picked it. But I can see, what, I can see your point, but then again, you, you are under time pressure if you're playing a first-person shooter online. You have to finish within a certain amount of time. Oh, sorry, role-playing games. So you get, what, Fallout 3, for example? Or Oblivion. Oblivion, right, okay. Those are games I don't have an experience of playing, so I'll have to take the fifth on that, I'm afraid. I can't, I can't answer that question. But it's a good example of something that you know, could be constructed as a counter-argument to that. What, how would I apply that to something that, that we're not, games that aren't speeding up? Mm. The well, there, there is a, what is it, well, you have that, a, from what I saw of the presentation of Flower, mm -hmm. you have that kind of, you would argue that that was trying to provide some kind of inertia for the gamer, and you're sitting there and you're not really kind of actively involved in what's going on, and you kind of take a back seat to what's going on, so you, you kind of create that kind of inertia. But there's still elements of speed in flower, from what I can understand, the swooping across the landscapes. Um, and that, that would certainly have a, a kind of an effect of inertia. Because any video game is, is effectively to do with inertia. You're sitting there and you're not, you are not moving, but you have this kind of ability to move through lots of different spaces and times. And there are different ways in which... Well, I thought, I thought that, was, that was clear from what I said at the end. I mean, I was saying that Operation Wolf gives a demonstration of, con of what happens at a concentration camp and, a, and an airport, and they are similar technologies in that respect. I don't really, I'm sorry, I don't really understand your question, to be honest. What is the implication of the speed in the app that, that, that um, the continuity, the continuity driving for the set of games um, push in terms of Well, the fact that we rely on these technologies to, to for it, that speed becomes basically the, the way in which we live, and 
there are relationships between not, not being quick and being quick, but that is, it is important that we move with increasing speed. And that's what digital technology is all about, navigating, proliferating spaces with, with speed. And video games, I think, certainly from the 1980s, would give a, a kind of a good example of that. Yeah, I do talk about that in, in other parts of it, but not, that's not in that chapter. That is kind of an analysis of the kind of so social impact of games rather than how the user interacts with them. But, I mean, I, I know I keep going back to it, but, you know, that's, video games are effectively about creating an inertia and, you know, being mouse potatoes and, and things like that. But, no, I haven't looked at the way in which um, it affects the user, especially not in that one. Um, you've used quite old games to demonstrate. Yeah. So what about a game like um, uh, um, Need for Speed, uh, Need for Speed Underground? Uh, I think the, that the, the environment or uh, the, the space is quite uh, uh, important for the, the, the experience to play Need for Speed. It's not, not just about speed, it's about... Um, you mean that this is a tendency uh, for... In, you mean that it's symptomatic for society that we... Um, Do we move with increasing speed? Yes. Yeah. But don't, but don't you see that there's... Or don't you think that there are... Um, um, that there are... Um, So we have an increased reliance on space rather than time, which I think goes back to what that guy was saying there. Do mean the spaces that we move through? But it's, it's to do with speed. It, with the very title of, of the game, Need for Speed, is to do with that. Uh, I think there that. are a lot of people uh, missing, uh, 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 wanting the, the more spatial and formal uh, experiences, both in life and in games. And, and we will see, uh, see that in the development of, of new computers. So that's why we play video games to navigate these these spaces. No, not only. May I have a comment on that? Yes, yeah, sure. So the, the, there is a philosophical question of whether it's possible to make time 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 compared to space. I mean, if it's possible to make time part independent and part more timely than space. And that in itself is a discussion uh, in the metaphysical literature. Um, Heidegger says, for instance, that space, uh, time is more primary than space, and argues extensively for that. But Kant disagrees, for instance, and says that it's impossible to have a conception of time without also presupposing space. So there is a conditional relation between them in the sense that you can't have the time conception without also presupposing the space. And an example of that is when you are counting, for instance, which we think about a procedure in space, in time, sorry. We have to uh, uh, visualize that, at least in mind, uh, uh, spatially, in mm -hmm. order to make that sequence of units that you do when you count, for instance. So that's well, one of the arguments. So in itself, it's a philosophical question. Of course, this is an analysis in a cultural level, and uh, more specifically at the game level, but still it touches upon the more metaphysical uh, question. So I, I guess that that was partly was material and emotion. So time and space is... They're interrelated, and that's what, that's what I try and do. And, I, I, you know, when you read some of the literature, especially gaming literature, people talk about the space that opens up the space of the player, virtual spaces, but there's no definition of that kind of thing used. And it's used with such abandon that it's, it's a real problem in game studies. And you can't talk about space, a, a space opening up without talking about time. It's not possible. And that's, you know, all right, time, is, time obliterates space. When you get on an airliner, you talk about how 
how long the trip's going to be. It's not about how far you're going to travel. That's what the pilot tells you, how long you're going to be on there, the duration. It's not about, you know, how, how many miles you travel or how many kilometers you travel. And there is, there is a real problem with game studies. It doesn't talk about space with, without defining what it is. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to write something on that, and I never got around to it. Yeah, that, that's a good example. Sorry, about what? Digital technology. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Is there something about digital technology that is sort of that fits the rigorous theory particularly well, so that's why you're using computer games? Yeah, there is that, yeah. Because, it, it, you know, when he talks about speed and information, that's exactly what it's about. The fact that he talks about speed being information itself. And, you know, the faster you can get hold of something, the better it is. And that is what the internet effectively does, as, a, as a, an ICTs do. They give you everything instantly, pretty much or near instantly. And that, that fits with, you know, Viridio's theories <coughs> of speed. So if you had written the book 100 years ago with these other technologies as examples, then, then you would not do this with your games as well? If, well, I guess, I guess so. If you give an example of trains, then you have the, the corresponding example of the airport novel or something like that, which is, you know, something pulpy that you, you read while you, you're going from place to place. And you're waiting as well for things like that. <laughs>